So I've been doing a series of Bible studies on God's plan, the big plan, the plan that existed within the heart of the divine community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that existed before time began, before anything was created, before the earth or the heavens or anything. One of the things that I started wondering about was, was death always a part of the plan? Was Adam um, sinning and dying always a part of the plan? And if that was the case, then the, the place of the dead, Sheol or Hades, would have also been uh, created in the beginning when everything was created. Uh, Sheol or Hades is the underworld. It's a part of the earth. It's considered under the earth. And it was made in the beginning when everything was made. So then I started asking some other questions, including who then was the very first person to go into the grave? Who was the first person to die? Because I thought, well, that's probably significant to know who is the first person who would be the very first occupant of the grave. Now, I'm just going to highlight some verses, particularly one verse that is, is sort of the theme verse for all of these Bible studies on the plan of God. And that is Colossians 1, verses 15 through 17, that talks about how everything in creation was made by and through and for Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So all things were created in the beginning, all realms, okay, including heaven and earth, um, whether celestial realms or terrestrial realms, and that included even the place of the dead, Sheol, which was empty at the time of creation. There was nobody in it. It was one of those spaces that probably didn't have an angel or angelic authority or ruler placed over it because at that point in time no angel had fallen satan hadn't fallen there wasn't any uh, specific um, need i guess at that point in time to have uh, someone who was would be the ruler over the place of the dead when paul in colossians talks about christ creating thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities this is the system of um, administration of how he would operate and administrate everything that he'd made. He does it through delegation and stewardship. So eventually, after Lucifer's fall, um, then some angel would be assigned over the place of the dead, and that would be a spirit we call Hades, or the Bible refers to him as Hades, and also there is a spiritual being uh, identified with the name death. And death and Hades eventually are going to be cast into the lake of fire as well as the place of the dead. So let's talk about the first occupant of the grave. The first mention of anything in scriptures is highly important and we're going to talk about the law or the rule of first mention, principle of first mention here in a minute. So who was the very first person to go into the grave? whose body would die and their spirit would go into uh, Sheol or Hades. Well, that was Abel. Abel was killed or slain by his brother Cain. And so Abel actually became the first occupant of Sheol. Now the story of Cain and Abel is found in Genesis 4 verses 1 through 16. And I'm going to go ahead and read this story. And Adam had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man, she said. Later, she gave birth to Cain's brother, Abel. 
Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, while Cain was a tiller of the soil. So in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord, while Abel brought the best portions of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but he had no regard for Cain and his offering. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Why are you angry, said the Lord to Cain, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you refuse to do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires you, but you must master it. Then Cain said to his brother, Let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I do not know, he answered. Am I my brother's keeper? What have you done? Replied the Lord. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you till the ground, it will no longer yield its produce to you. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. But Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, this day you have driven me from the face of the earth, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Not so, replied the Lord. If anyone slays Cain, then Cain will be avenged sevenfold. And the Lord placed a mark on Cain, so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Abel, in the scriptures, is actually a type of Christ. Abel was the very first person whose death would later be used as a prophetic foreshadow of the death of Christ. So what do I mean when I say that Abel is a type of Christ? Well, in the study of hermeneutics, which is how to do Bible study, a biblical type is an illustration of a person or thing found in the Old Testament that will foreshadow something else in the New Testament. When we say that someone is a type of Christ, what we're saying is that there's a person in the Old Testament who behaves in a way that corresponds to Jesus' character and actions in the New Testament. And when we say something is typical of Christ, we're saying that an object or event in the Old Testament can be viewed as representative of some quality of Jesus. So there's a difference between an illustration and a type. A type is always identified as such in the New Testament. So sometimes students of the Bible will erroneously assign the category of type to some, some person in the Old Testament. For example, Joseph, who was sold into slavery, is an illustration of Christ. There's, it, there's kind of a foreshadow there of Christ who was sold by his brothers and then uh, you know, brought into a very low position and then raised uh, into the second highest position in Egypt. But in the New Testament, Joseph is never used as a type of Christ. So it's an, he's an illustration, he's a foreshadow, he's kind of prophetic, but strictly speaking, he's not a type. So if Abel is a type of Christ, we're going to find the typology in the New Testament. And so where do we see that? Where in the New Testament do we find Abel being mentioned? Hebrews 12, 23b and 24. You've come to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So here we see Jesus who has sprinkled blood and Abel who has sprinkled blood. And there is a contrast that's being drawn between the blood of Christ and the blood of Abel. Okay, Abel's blood is crying out for vengeance, whereas Christ's blood, as we're going to see in a minute, is what justifies us. But the blood of 
Abel crying out from the ground is actually the very first mention of the word blood in the Bible as well. And so the death of this very first man, Abel, who is a type of Christ, and the blood that was shed are also connected here. The first mention of anything in the scripture usually gives us the foundation of a biblical theme that we can follow throughout scripture. The blood of both Abel and Christ were sprinkled, and the blood of both of them speaks. Abel's blood cried out to God for justice, but the blood of Christ brings justification from sin and peace with God. Uh, Genesis 4.10, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. That's what the Lord told Cain. Romans 5, 9 and 10 speaks about Christ. Therefore, since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from wrath through him? For if, when we were enemies of God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Abel's death prefigured Christ's death at the hands of his brothers, the Jews. Cain was Abel's brother, and Cain premeditated the death of his brother Abel. He actually had him come out to the field, which is his turf. Okay, That was where um, Cain raised his crops. He invited his brother to come into a place where he would later kill him. Genesis 4, 8. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. The Bible also prophesied that the Messiah would be killed by his brethren, that they would not receive him and that he would die at their hands. And just before Jesus was about ready to uh, be crucified within you know, a matter of a few days, he spoke about how the Jews of his day, the Jewish leaders in particular, were going to be held accountable for the death of not only the Messiah, but of all the righteous people whose blood was shed by people who were their brethren, who were jealous of them. Matthew 23, 29 through 36. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. You say, if we'd lived in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Okay, make a note of that, shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of sin of your fathers, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell, or Gehenna? Because of this, I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and others you will flog in the synagogues and persecute in town after town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly, I tell you, all these things will come upon this generation. Okay, this is some really heavy stuff here that Christ is saying. Basically, that the blood of every righteous person that God has sent, every prophet, every wise man, every teacher that was murdered, by people like them was going to be laid at the feet or laid upon the generation that crucified the Messiah. Now the first recorded death in the Bible was the murder of a righteous man, someone sent by God as a prophet and a teacher. There are two New Testament passages that refer to Abel as being a righteous man. And in this passage that we just read, he is also referred to as a prophet or a wise man or a teacher. He is the first of the prophets who would be persecuted 
by his brethren. Hebrews 11.4 speaks of Abel as a righteous man. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God gave approval to his gifts. And by faith, he still speaks even though he is dead. Matthew 23.35 And so upon you will come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel. Jesus included Abel in the list of prophets and wise men sent by God. Matthew 23, 34 and 35. Because of this, I'm sending you prophets and wise men and teachers, and some of them you will kill and crucify, and others you will flog in your synagogues and persecute in town after town. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah. In the same way that the blood of Abel cried out to God for vengeance, Christ's blood would be required of the generation that killed him. God spelled out the judgment that befell Cain. His land would be unfruitful, and he would be banished from the land, away from his inheritance and away from the presence of God. The Jews of Jesus' day were banished too, sent out of their land, exiled and dispersed throughout the nations because they shed the blood of Christ. So I know some of you are saying, well, the, surely not all the Jews are condemned. Surely not everybody in, in Jesus' day who cried out for Jesus' crucifixion is going to be condemned and sent to hell. Well, the answer to that is, of course not. Peter actually preached a message of reconciliation to those who, who only days before had cried out for the crucifixion of the Lord. This is kind of a long passage, but I want you to hear it because this is how, um, even though the, the generation of Jews who lived at that time would be dispersed throughout the world, that this judgment fell upon the nation as a whole, individuals within the nation would be spared. That is, that individuals could be saved even though the nation was dispersed and Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed and basically they became a uh, wanderers just like Cain was a wanderer on the earth. Let's read this passage from Acts. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over and rejected him before Pilate, even though he had decided to release him. You rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead and we are witnesses of the fact. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see, this is a man who just been healed, has been made strong. It is in Jesus' name and faith that comes through him that has given him this complete healing in your presence. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But in this way, God has fulfilled what he foretold through the prophets, saying that the Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn back so that your sins may be wiped away, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ who's been appointed for you. Uh, let's go down to verse 24. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have proclaimed these days. And you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers when he said to Abraham, Through your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So whereas because of the fathers who had uh, persecuted all the prophets that had been sent to them, Peter is also saying that you are sons of the prophets. You're not just the sons of those who murdered the prophets. You who hear the voice of Christ, you who choose to believe in him, are sons of the prophets, sons of the covenant that God made with your fathers. And you, you actually have an opportunity now to 
repent of what you did, okay, which you clearly are responsible for in rejecting Christ and handing him over and killing the author of life. You can repent of that and now you can receive times of refreshing from the Lord. So the very first death was the murder of a righteous man at the hands of his brother. That was Abel, killed by, by Cain. The very first occupant of the grave was not Adam, it wasn't Eve, it wasn't anybody else. It was, it was Abel, who was murdered. Abel, who was killed, who is a type of Christ. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. The Bible tells us that it's the soul that sins that shall die. Genesis 2.17 but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. That's what God told the man, told Adam. Don't eat from that tree. The day that you eat from it, you will surely die. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Okay, you, you overstep the boundaries that are given in the garden, you will die. If you sin, you will die. Now here's the thing. Jesus was without sin. He had no sin. He was a truly innocent and righteous man. And because he was sinless, he was not legally subject to the death penalty. In the spiritual realms, Jesus could not legally be put to death because he'd never sinned. Death was something that was for sinners, not for those who who never sin. And the reason death could not hold Jesus was because he never sinned and the boundaries had been overstepped. So when Satan contrived this plot to kill Jesus and he used Judas and the, the Jewish leaders of the day, Satan overstepped his bounds. When death and Hades received Christ into the place of the dead, they too overstepped their bounds. Because of this miscalculation on Satan's part, not only was Christ able to obtain the keys of death and Hades and thus overpower death for everyone, he became the substitutionary atoning sacrifice that enabled fallen humanity to be brought into a right relationship with God. We read about this in Hebrews 2 verses 9 and 14. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Now, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. If the spiritual rulers of this age, that is, the fallen ones who still have places of dominion and rulership and power, if they had known the consequences of their actions, they would have never had Jesus crucified. Never. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8. Among the mature, however, we speak a message of wisdom. But it's not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of the mysterious and hidden wisdom of God, which he destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. So what is this wisdom of God, this hidden wisdom? Well, the wisdom of God was the cross. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, that is, in Christ, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, 
by making peace through the blood of the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were hostile in your minds because of your evil deeds, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy, unblemished, and blameless in his presence. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Satan in his pride didn't understand that God's power over him would be achieved through the humility and death of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 through 11 talks about humility and the humility of Christ, which, by the way, is an attribute of God. Later on, I'm going to be talking about the humility of God, because only a God who has this kind of humility can have it be exercised and expressed in Christ, okay, which we're going to read about here in a minute. And only a God who is humble will not insist upon everybody worshiping him or loving him or serving him. A God who is humble will allow his created beings, the angels and people, to decide whether they will love and respect and honor and serve and worship God or not. Okay, God did not insist upon it. Um, he wants it. He wants us to choose it, but he does not insist upon it. And right there is the difference between Satan, who is full of pride, and God, who is meek and lowly in a way that we really don't understand, but we see it manifested in Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. And I'm just going to make a little note here. Satan was grasping at equality with God. He wanted to be equal with God and have all of God's glory. Christ didn't consider it uh, as something that he needed to hold on to. He already was in the form of God, but he did not need to grasp onto what you know all the prerogatives of deity verse 7 but he emptied himself taking the form of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself and became obedient to death even death on a cross Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Revelation 5, 2 through 6. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy? to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look inside. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. And then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb who appeared to have been slain. So the lion actually was only a lion because he was the lamb who was slain. Victory comes through death. Exaltation comes through humility. This is the wisdom of God as exemplified in the person of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 21 through 24. For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, 
a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Satan, death, and Hades are all defeated foes. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, all mankind will one day be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 26. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming those who belong to him. And then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he's destroyed all dominion and authority and power. That is, dominions, authorities, and powers that have come against him. And of course, that's after the millennium. And he must reign until he's put his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And interestingly enough, death and Hades are the final two entities who will be thrown into the lake of fire after Satan. Revelation 20, 11 through 14. And then I saw a great white throne and one seated on it. Earth and heaven fled from his presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And there were open books and one of them was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their deeds as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and Hades gave up their dead, and each one was judged according to his deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And that is the end of the story. So when I was first um, studying all of this and asking the questions, so was Sheol created in the beginning, the place of, of the dead created in the beginning when um, all things were created through Christ and for Christ uh, in the very beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. And I realized that, yes, Sheol would have been created when the earth was created because it's under the earth. And if that was the case, then that meant that death was actually a part of the plan. And I've talked about that in other videos. And what I haven't really talked about specifically is how death coming into the world was actually the fail safe. A fail safe is something that's built into a, a program or, or some, some plan so that when it looks like things are going wrong, it can be corrected. <laughs> so, Death was built in as a failsafe for humanity. Angels that fell, they don't have a failsafe, which is why any fallen angel um, that you know fell, any angel that fell along with Satan is going to be destroyed. There was no way to build in a failsafe into their existence. But because we are mortal, we have bodies that can return to dust and our spirit can be separated out from the body. Sin can be judged. And remember the sin nature dwells in the body. That's the teaching of Paul in Romans chapter 7 that the sin problem is connected with the body and it has this downward pull on our soul and our spirit is separated from God because of all this. But because our bodies can die, we can also be made alive once uh, once Christ died and took the keys of death and Hades and has made a way for us to be brought back into a relationship with God spiritually and so that our souls can be redeemed and we can be given a resurrection body. For those of us who are believers, our resurrection body will be a glorified immortal body. And for uh, people who are not saved, they will be resurrected too. They'll be resurrected into a mortal body. And if their names are found written in the book of life, they will go on to live on the new earth and they will be the guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And of course, we, we are the bride. And as the bride, we, along with the Spirit, will be inviting the guests to come and partake of the tree of life and drink from the water of life. 
So because death was built into all of this, it was part of the plan. And Christ's death and resurrection was part of the plan. And the fall of man was even incorporated into this plan so that Christ could be born as a man, that he could die. And because Satan and death and Hades overstepped their bounds, uh, he could then gain power over death and Hades. And uh, Hebrews tells us that it's through Christ's death that he destroys him who has the power of death, that is, the devil. So death became the means by which Satan is destroyed, uh, death and Hades are destroyed, and the means by which all men will be resurrected from the dead and given an immortal body. Now, some of those who are resurrected from the dead, um, particularly if they take the mark of the beast, they worship the beast or um, worship the image of the beast, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. There are some others, uh, the beast himself, who is a man, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. As I believe uh, Judas, who is called the son of perdition, who it said that it would have been better if he'd never been born than... Um, you know, than to have betrayed Christ. Uh, I think he will also probably be thrown into the lake of fire. But as far as the bulk of humanity, Jesus saved us from the wrath that's to come. That the good news is that everybody will be resurrected from the dead. Everybody will be judged according to their works. And most people, I believe, are going to have their names found in the book of life. They will not have done anything that will have caused their name to be blotted out of the book of life. And then there is another class of humanity, and that is believers. We are those who are called out from the mass of humanity to be a part of Christ's body, to be the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones who are going to rule and reign with Christ during the millennium, and then who will ultimately be the bride of Christ uh, in the final day of God. So let me know what you think. Leave a comment in the comment section. I hope you've been blessed by this video. I'll leave the link to the show notes. And uh, till the next video, I pray you have a very, very blessed day.